back again. Oh, well, I think uh, in case I, I don't know whether uh, there could be some participants that might be seeing the video a little uh, choppy there. And if, if so, then apologies for that. Um, and so uh, welcome back to the second session. Um, and uh, for those who, of you who are just joining for the second session of today's talk on seminar, Digital Marketing with Google, welcome. Um, and a quick mention is that this session is recorded and will be on the Talk On website. Um, the video that I was just playing well, was a little choppy, but you know, in, in, at least it gave, gave, gave a little bit of a glimpse. And um, in, you know, the, the video that I was playing during the intermission was a Concord highlight video from 2019. Concord is Canada's largest community builder, and not only do we build homes and communities, we also are building connections. And today it is very wonderful to be able to connect with so many individuals in various cities across North America where Concord develops in. So thank you very much for all the attendance for participating. We are honored to have a great speaker uh, from Google of Google, Aaron Bemis, with us today to talk about digital marketing. And so without further delay, let me get back to Aaron. Hey Aaron. Hi again. Thanks so much for the introduction. If there are uh, some of you that are coming in, we've got well over 500 participants on today's webinar. We had over 900 registered. It is really fun and exciting to be here, but it also means there's a lot of questions to manage. So I apologize if you were with us for that first one. I know I didn't get to remotely close to all of them. I will try and do my best on the next intermission to keep going through as many as I can. But I'm really excited about this next piece. So we just spent a lot of time talking about social media, SEO, how to make all of those um, marketing pieces work for your business and make those connections, just like you were talking about, Isaac. So I'm ready to dive in and learn about some analytics and ads, yes? All right, let's go ahead and get started. I'm gonna turn off my video so you can't see me anymore. You should be able to see the screen. I know there were lots of questions about that at the beginning. And we'll let Isaac move over here as well. There he goes, perfect. So today, now we're gonna talk about using data to drive business growth, which is all about Google Analytics. And we're also going to spend a portion of this time talking about Google Ads as well, just from a very starter standpoint. So I think what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go through the data portion of the presentation, the analytics section, and then I'm gonna kind of pause because there were some really great questions on ads that came from the last session. And I wanna answer those kind of before we dive into the next section of ads. And then we'll go through into more questions. So that's kind of our path for today. If you are new, welcome. Here's all about me. Connect with me on LinkedIn, Instagram, and a little photo pictorial of my life. I'm a wife, I'm a mother, I'm a sister, I'm a traveler, and I'm supposed to be a beach bunny. But today, I'm a data bunny. So we're gonna talk about how data can actually help you make smart business decisions instead of throwing wet spaghetti noodles on the wall we're going to talk about how you can actually find the information that's attached to data online and make better choices knowing what you are actually working with so i will say this right here before i go any farther first of all i just i love this quote data makes your briefcase heavy but insights make you rich Right, because you can collect tons of data, but if you don't use it appropriately, it really doesn't mean anything. So breaking it down into a way that actually makes sense for you and trying to help you accomplish what you're looking for is a much bigger plan and a much better plan for moving you forward. So the other thing about data, you get to talk about one of my favorite things in life when it comes to digital marketing, and that's data. Every single thing that you do online, from social media, to email marketing, to your website, to your blog, to YouTube, to your ads, all of it. I don't care what platform you're on for any of those. There is data attached to all of it. And if you access it correctly, and you know how to interpret it, it's really great. Google My Business has insights, uh, ads have analytics attached to it, YouTube analytics are there, the um, data that's in email marketing would be open rates or click-through rates, right? On um, videos, you're going to see how long people watch them. Is it short? Is it long? On your website, it's who's coming to my website and where did they come from? Where were they before they got to you and 
Was it in search or did they come from your social media or did they come from your email newsletter? You can find what's working or you can find what's not working that, you, that should be and fix what's wrong to make it better. So I love data. And data also allows you to do one thing, which is also maybe my number two favorite thing about digital marketing. So the first is the amount of data that you have. And second, it's the fact that it allows you to shift and pivot. I want you to give yourself permission right out of the gate. Assuming you're watching your data, if you're doing something that's not providing you with results, quit. Stop what you're doing and try something else. But don't just quit out of the gate either. Make adjustments and try and fix it. And if it's still not working, it's okay. Try something different. Don't keep wasting your time on something that's not going to give you good results back. And by results back means, is it making you more money in the long run? Is it attracting those customers? Is it helping you with the property? Is it helping you with right, all these different pieces that you need to know about? If it is, Great, keep doing it, get better at it. If it's not, try something different. Shift and pivot, an old old athletic window. So in unlocking new opportunities, whoops, how did I skip a little thing here? Oh no, we're talking about insights now. Unlocking new opportunities, insights must be three things. They must be novel, they must be credible, and they must be actionable. And so in this customer journey for today, I know you guys are real estate agents, but we're going to talk about Wicked Good Cupcakes. And this is Tracy and Danny, and they are the owners of Wicked Good Cupcakes. And back in 2010, they took a cooking class and they decided they wanted to be bakers. And so they opened up Wicked Good Cupcakes. Of course, Wicked Good hints to the fact that it's over by Boston, right? They're good partners with Google. And so we continue to use them as great examples. You may or may not know Tracy and Danny from this little tiny show that's out there called Shark Tank. They were on it, and that's what really pushed them over the edge. But what sets them apart from their competitors is they decided, as I said, they wanted to go and be bakers, and they have really great cupcakes, thus their name. But what they couldn't do was ship their cupcakes, because shipping a cupcake, how do you keep it fresh? How do you keep it intact and not smushed with all the frosting and everything else? And they realized and undercovered that you could put a cupcake in a jar, in a mason jar, and it would protect it. So you could ship it to anywhere, and that's how they grew their business. Now, in addition to that, it also keeps longer so that it preserves your flavor of your cupcake. Then they're ready to go to the next level. Well, what do they do? They got really good at analytics on their online stuff. So they used to make all of their decisions on gut instinct. They would try new recipes and just throw it out there and immediately put it on the menu, but there was never any testing done ahead of time or there was never any you know, product consultation. Is it, does this work? Does it not? They would cut prices when their sales were down and they assumed that their target audience was women between the ages of 35 to 54. All of these things were actually bad decisions that were hurting them, not helping them. And so before we go any farther, I've given you the intro to Wicked Good because I'm going to use them as examples as I move through the data presentation. But there's a couple of things that I want to make sure that we are on the same page with in terms of the language that we're using, right? I, I talked earlier in the presentation about making sure we're using words that connect with your audience. I want to make sure that you understand my words that I'm using. So when I say data, I'm talking about facts or statistics, analytics are things that are going to show us patterns and trends. And insights are the things that are actionable value. And so you want to look at numbers to make better business decisions instead of gut, right? That's the key. So here is our agenda for this portion of the presentation. We're going to start with actually talking about goals. Because if you don't know what your goals are and you don't have them outlined in a way that matches, you really don't know how to apply the data to decide if you're actually getting anywhere or not. The second step is asking the questions. What do you, what answers do you need? What are you actually looking for? And then the final section is the reporting section where we're actually gonna take a hard look at analytics. And then I'm going to go into the advertising section of the presentation. Outlining goals first. 
there is a SMART model, and that's what makes a goal good. SMART stands for specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time sensitive, right? So not just saying, I want to increase sales. Maybe your goal is, I want to increase my sales by 20% by 2021. Okay, now we're talking time sensitive, 2021. Relevant? Yes, because you're in sales. Is it attainable? Okay, well, that's a good question, right? Because if you sold 10 properties in 2019, and so far you've only sold two in 2020, is it attainable to actually show a growth of that percentage by 2021? I don't know. You have to tell me. So pay attention to that. Make sure it's attainable. Goals don't do any good if, it, if you don't have a shot of actually getting to them. Measurable. How are you going to track it? Well, I can track it through my numbers. I know what I sold then. I know what I need to sell next. I need to know what it's going to hit my goal. Specific. I want to increase my sales. Yes, that, that works. So in our example with Wicked Good, their goal was to decrease their shopping cart abandonment rate to under 60%. Now, shopping cart abandonment, not a thing for you guys right now, right? We haven't, I don't, most of us, I don't think have gotten to this where we're actually buying property online through a, an e-commerce site. Not, not really. Too many other pieces that go with it, right? We have to do site inspections and we have to do all of our finances and we have to submit all of our applications, right? And our reviews and ugh, there's so many pieces to it. So this isn't applicable to you, but it still shows what a smart goal was. So our next step, after we have a goal established, is deciding what kind of questions that we need to be asking. What are we looking for in our data? What do we want our data to provide to us? So the first type, of, there's kind of four buckets of questions. Reach, engage, convert, and sustain. The so reach questions are really all about that. Who is your audience and how are you connecting with them? How are you, how are you making that? connection, establishing that connection. Conversion is, are you taking your leads and turning them into customers? Engagement is that interaction between the both of you in the digital space. And so a lot of this, I just wanna remind you, we're talking about analytics here in a data capacity and in a digital format. So I'm not, when I say engagement, I know that we're gonna build engagement when we're face to face and it's much harder to do behind a keyboard but it's imperative that you try and do it. And then sustaining, because clearly return customers are significantly more profitable than going out and trying to find a new customer. So those are the four different categories. And I wanna kind of break them down a little bit more and really make you think about it because these are the things that you want to find supporting data in to point you in the right direction. So in the reach category, I want you to think about things of what are people actually searching for? Again, this goes to what words are they using, right? How are they connecting with you? Who is that audience? Meaning what kind of demographics are we dealing with? Are, are you trying to go after the newer, younger families? Or are you trying to go after that more established later in life couple with more disposable income? Who is that audience? What do they actually look like? Pinpoint their demographics. And connected to that, how are they finding you online? Are they using social media? Are they on your email list because they've been a previous client and then now they return? Do they meet you uh, through a, a video that you've done? Is it your YouTube channel that you have posted? Or do they just do a general search? on Google and they found your information. So these are the kinds of things that you really wanna be thinking about when it comes to your consumers. The next bucket of questions are the engagement questions. So these are the kinds of things that we're trying to think about, what are they doing once they get you? So reaching them is getting you, to you. Now that you've got them, what do they do once they're there? Do you have a virtual tour of that new development property? in Vancouver. And so you're going to watch, if I'm the consumer, do I watch the whole thing or do I fall off after two minutes? 
because these are the kinds of things that can really be impactful, right? If you're doing videos or you're doing a virtual tour kind of a thing, you can see how long people are watching different segments. And if you're consistently producing, let's say a five minute virtual tour video, but people are actually only watching the first minute of them, why are you continuing to produce content that doesn't get watched? It's too long, right? Shorten it up, get a little more to the point. So what are they doing? Did they fill out a form? Maybe you had a form to fill out. Did they uh, register for an open house perhaps that you're having and you're doing a pre-registration? Did they request more information on a property, right? Often we're promoting properties online and you can click this button to learn more. And so they're requesting a packet of information about that property from you. And then where are they engaging with you online is just as important as to what they're doing, right? That kind of points us to what buckets we're spending our time in. Are, is it on our website? Is that where our best success is? Is it our social media engagement? Is it our email marketing? Which component are we, which channel, right? And, and focusing in on that. And then the how, right? Again, that language is such an important piece and that's the how as well. And are they commenting on something? Because they might be also interacting with you. Maybe if it's in a social media post, for example, they're not actually talking to you. They didn't leave a comment, but they shared it to their page or they shared it to a group. That's an interaction. That's a really great one actually, because they're spreading your information. They found it valuable enough that they wanted to share it with others. That's marketing gold. The conversion bucket questions fall under the channel specific stuff. So which channels are actually driving the conversion? <laughs> Again, is it the social media? Is it YouTube? Is it search? Is it email? What is it? And then what calls to action are actually driving it too? So if you have people filling out a form, like a lead form so that you can then contact them, how many questions do you have on your lead form? And I would say this is very appropriate in the lead form, just as much as I would talk about it in a checkout process of an e-commerce site as well. The amount of forms, the amount of questions that people have to answer online, the more fields there are for me to fill in, the less likely I am to do it. So although I know it would be helpful to you if you knew if they had children and two dogs and a cat and their hair was purple when they were 16 and they only have three tires on their car instead of four is that information actually necessary for you to establish a relationship with them in order to build a relationship and hopefully earn a customer right the short and sweet and yeah you might want to know all that stuff about them but that's the kind of stuff that you find out when you're having that initial conversation on the phone, right? So here's my three questions. I need your name, I need your zip code, and I need to know what you're looking for. Are you, do you want to rent or buy? Right? Rent, buy, sell, I guess, would be my three buckets in a real fair situation. And how do you want me to contact you? You know, your preference. And make it by their preference, right? If you might have to email someone and when you would rather pick up the phone. I get it, I'm still in sales too. So I understand how much better I can do when I'm talking to someone than when I'm behind a computer screen. However, if my customer wants to communicate via text, then I'm gonna text them. If they want me to email them, then I'm gonna email them. If they want me to FaceTime, darn right, I'm gonna FaceTime, like it or not, right? I think we're all getting a little over that in these days that we're in where everyone's in video format, but it's getting there. But you need to also pay attention to your channels, which ones are actually driving conversions, and then which ones actually have the highest return on investment too. Because some of your channels, although maybe not as high in activity for conversions, still give you conversions and they're a very low cost, low time investment. So you should continue those if they're helping your cause. Others have a significant cost to them and don't give you that much bang for your buck. This is where I tell you to shift and pivot move away to something that's actually working. And our sustainability questions are pointed more to keeping that return customer, right? Do people continue to stay 
connected to you after you have completed a deal with them. You have sold them this property. Do they come to you when they're ready to sell it or when they're ready to buy another one or they're ready to invest again, right? There's probably a lot of investors out there in your real estate world. Hopefully you've got a bunch of them in your pocket. That'd be great from a sales perspective. So how are they continuing with you? Do they and then how and where? How do they stay in touch with you? Is it via the phone? Is it through your newsletter? Is it social media? Is it your website? Probably not as much your website for sustainability, right? It's more on the social media probably or your email. Again, email is pretty powerful. So something to think about there. And your response time is critical as we all know, right? How quickly is too quick? Well, I think it depends on the day. There are days where I am lickety split and on it with my responses like this because I've got the time and the functionality to do so. But I have other clients that I work with, not just this group here today. And my response time this afternoon is none because I'm with all of you. So there's a little bit of a pattern. Clearly, an afternoon is not a big deal, but it could be a big deal if it's a week, right? And so your response also makes me another little general marketing trigger. If you're going out of town, <laughs> make sure you turn on your out of office responder, right? Make sure that you're posting somewhere so that people know that you're currently unavailable and give them a method to get an alternative solution because they may have something that's time sensitive that won't wait until you get back. And then the last key to this is, do you give people a reason to return? What are you doing to make people want to work with you more? Is it your sparkling personality? I know in real estate, your, your personal connection that you have with your clients is your golden ticket, right? Like that's what it's really all about. But do you give them a reason to return? Do you have a newsletter list to keep them in contact with you? Do you... Uh, I don't know, do you send them a holiday card and or maybe just a, you know, it's your, do you have an anniversary package that you're doing? That was something that I was doing back in the day was, you know, congratulations on one year in your home kind of a deal. So it was a, just a continual touch and it helped build the relationship. Granted, I was a realtor back before social media, before digital marketing. We had databases and we were doing email marketing at the time, but it was nothing like what it is now. And it certainly was more work. So things to think about as you're walking through that process, again, sustaining your customers is significantly cheaper, definitely more cost effective, and also just way more enjoyable as long as you like that client that you're working with. So here's the meat of the part for the analytics that I really love. And it's actually going into the report section. So Google Analytics as a whole is a free tool for anyone who has a website. You can get started by going to google.com slash analytics. It will walk you through step by step how to attach analytics to your site. Now, there's a couple of components here that I want to touch base on because I think it's very industry specific to you. I think there are going to be some of you that have your own websites in addition to having your brokerage websites, right? Your company's website, and then you have your own. Maybe you only are part of your brokerage website. You don't have your own. These are things to think about when you're doing it. If you don't have your own website and you're just a portion of your broker's site, then the analytics for you isn't necessarily something that you can attach, right? You can't find out, but hopefully your brokerage will share this information with you about how many people have clicked on your link specifically, right? Or have gone to the listings that you have available on the website for that. So google.com slash analytics, it's free. There's a couple of different ways you can attach it to your site. If you have your own, uh, you can take a snippet of information and attach it to the backside of your website. It'll talk back to Google and you'll be connected. Um, or you can do a couple of other things. It's very simple, I promise you. Um, the types of insights that you can garner from analytics. These are the things that we're really looking at. These are actually what I would call the buckets, if you will, on analytics. So they're the type of reports we're going to be looking at. We have real-time reports, which is exactly what it says. What's happening right now? I want to know, did that radio interview or that TV presence interview that I gave last night, did that do anything today? 
is that making me have an uptick in my web presence or on my social media or whatever I promoted? Conversions reports are going to talk about whether your website is actually successful, right? Are you taking people from this and moving to the next section? Audience is going to be all about your demographics, learning who we are and what we do, right? So for me, you would learn that I am a woman, that I am between 40 and 50. You're going to learn that I'm in Michigan. You're going to learn that I have readers. No, I'm kidding. That those are the basics that you need really paying attention to. And then acquisition reports is going to tell you where your customers are coming from, right? So again, that are they coming from social media? Are they coming from your website? Are they coming from another partnership that you have, perhaps, right? Maybe you have. Uh, you were a guest writer for someone else's blog, or you were highlighted on someone else's website. Are those leads coming to your website now too? So you can see which ones and what type of things that you're doing are actually garnering you customers, or at least the lead portion of your customer. And then the behavior reports are going to tell us what people actually do on your website. So it's following, they went from here to there, to here to there, and they got to that video and they left. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. There are um, quite a few people that appear to be popping in right now too. So I wanna pause before I move forward. Yes, these sessions are being recorded. Yes, these slides will be shared with you after as well. So you'll have both of those. All right, so let's talk about individual reports now within analytics. Before, actually I'm gonna go back a slide and I want you to look at that too closely. I have one caveat that I need for you to hear very clearly about Google Analytics. Google Analytics is and can be, can be and is, a giant black hole of information. And it can be very overwhelming. So what I want for you to do is to promise me this. If you're new to analytics, I want you to set a timer on your phone or an appointment or whatever you do and give yourself 20 minutes at a time, 20 minute snippets to go in, touch this portion, play around with it, feel it, and get out before you get overwhelmed. And then the next time you log in, that part is probably going to be a little more familiar. You're going to try another part. Because analytics, like I said, is like the black hole. You, it's often like getting online. Like when you say, I'm going to go get online and check the weather, and then 10 minutes later, you're watching goats jumping over each other, which has absolutely nothing to do with what you're trying to do with your day you can lose your time and your focus very quickly. I don't want that to happen to you. I want to set you up for success. So please do it in small snippets. That's the best piece of advice I can give you. So diving in, where do you go first? Well, some of these are gonna be more appropriate to some of you than the others, right? And especially with this many of you online at the same time. This is again, Wicked Good Cupcakes was very generous in sharing all of their reports with us and allowing us to share it with all of you so that you can see things. So in the real-time report, again, this is where they're using things like when they go online and they have a, a, or not online, on TV, or they have a press tour, or they have an interview that popped up on a blog, or a Shark Tank sent them a message and said, just an FYI, we're going to give a, a quick little update about you on next week's episode. And they can come in and look next week and say, whoa, we just got another big jump because of that, right? Something very specific happened that brought people to me today. Maybe it's an ad that you're running. Maybe it was um, a publication that was released. These are all types of reasons that you would be looking at real-time reports. So kind of quickly, you're going to be able, I'm going to start at the top right-hand corner. I'm going to work my way across and down the left-hand side and then just peek into the inside, right? So you're going to have your log in, which is this little circle with your face, the question mark, which seems very clear. This is where you go for support. I don't know what this is. I need help on, I don't understand how to click on the question mark. Notifications for the little bell. This is the account that you're in, the Wicked Cupcakes. And then the left-hand side, this is your dashboard. So. In the reports tab, right, I kind of talked to you about those buckets. This is the real-time report, and I am on the overview page. 
Now you can also look at locations, traffic sources, content, events, and conversions all within the real-time report. And if you wanna make yourself really crazy, you can start crossing some of these layers, if you will, between one report and another, set up different filters to do things like that. As for the super advanced and crazy, even I don't touch that stuff. I stay right here. So in my overview, over on the right, you can see I have 152 active users. 83% of them are from a desktop and once, or excuse me, 17% on a mobile. Top referrals came from AOL. Your top social traffic from Facebook and the active pages. These are the actual page names of your website. You can see which one is the most popular. There are three active users on the shop online. Okay, so just a quick little overview in here on that one. Um, okay, here's a specific question for this that I wanna answer. The analytics, is that Google Analytics on wickedgoodcupcakes.com or is it the analytics of their website? It is the analytics of their website. They screenshotted their analytics account of their website. This is not the Google portion. This is actual their actual Google Analytics. Does that answer your question, Sam, I hope. Okay, so in the conversions, again, just a quick little overview. Your top would be the same. Now we're in the conversions report over here on the left on our dashboard. And to find the overview, you would come to the e-commerce section and then down to the overview. So your e-commerce conversion right here, transactions, their revenue, average order, unique purchases. More importantly to me, the source, right? Where is the source coming from? Your organic sourcing is fantastic, 31% right there. And then you can see down here, you got some Facebook referrals, there's Yahoo, there's Bing, which I didn't even know was a thing. You get direct and none, wicked good to go. Okay, so you can see some different things. Time of purchase. I would actually, in your, your situation, e-commerce isn't even gonna be necessary. You're gonna spend more time in the goals phase. On the audience report, this is where we're talking again about demographics, right? This is where you get to see who we are, when we're there. So this is all of our users, the date range for this one, was July 1 of 17 to June 10 of 2018, so almost a year. 73% female. Okay, we kind of figured that. That's okay. But as you recall, earlier in the week, or in, in the week, my, my hours are starting to go to weeks in my presentation here, they actually thought that their idea ideal age range for their demographic was 35 to 44. It's actually 25 to 34 which shifts their marketing, right? Because where you're going to be marketing is different based on age. If, for example, their target, uh, or let's say their prime, their actual demographic, their leading demographic was the spar column on the right, the 65 and over, would they want to be marketing on TikTok? No, not, and not Snapchat either, and probably not Instagram. They'd be all over Facebook, right? But because we're clearly farther over to the left in the age bracket, the younger market is actually the one that's doing this. So then they're actually going to go through and go forward. A couple of questions. Economy is only for the website taking online orders. Yes, realtors don't record sales on our website. Correct, that is true. So you're not gonna go into the e-commerce section, but your demographics is who is visiting your website. It has nothing to do with sales reports or past sales performance that are here. And the same thing on the acquisitions. The acquisitions is how you are getting people to your website. So for them, this is really good. So again, you're going to the acquisition section here and then all the way down. They're actually looking at their AdWords. So your Google Analytics is attached to your Google Ads. And then you come down to search queries to find out who's actually using what words to find me, right? So in our first presentation talking about SEO, this is also directly related to that as well. Wicked Cupcakes is by far their most popular word choice, right? Wicked Good Cupcakes, plural, cupcake in a jar, gluten-free, cake in a jar. So all these different variations on their phrasing and their words. And depending on what you're actually looking for, in their case, I would be saying, well, I wanna look actually over here in the per session value, right? 
because although Wicked Good Cupcakes or Wicked Cupcakes is $3.52 per session, Wicked Good Cupcakes, people actually use my specific name, are at $8. And conversely, I have very few people looking for gluten free, <laughs> or at least when it comes to actually buying money, buying my product. Now, in the behavior reports, this is the this is the more advanced features. You do. I also want to say this: when you're going into these and the behavior flows, that requires you to set up some pretty intensive um, coding within your website and whatnot. You can certainly learn how to do it. There's no question about that. But it is for the a little farther advanced. But what it will do if you do set it up is. Hey, it'll give you your starting page and then it tells you where exactly they go. So you are literally following the flow of activity as I navigate through your website. I went here and then I went there and then I went here and when I went there. So what does that do? So that tells me, man, Erin went to this section when I really thought she should have gone over here. Well, why did she do that? And what do I have set something different? So we want to make sure that all of those things are paying attention to each other and going in the right direction. Here is a demo. So I wouldn't want to leave you totally left-handed without uh, having to just go and start your own analytics when you've never touched it before. So I wanted to make sure to give you this demo. So you can go to g.co slash grow slash analytics demo, and you can review the activities that are there and just play with the report, try and find the answers and go through them. So give you ability to touch and see Google Analytics without actually having to go and create an account yourself. Okay, so I'm in the recap section here for analytics. So I'm going to do this and then answer some of the analytics questions before I go back and do the ads. So we want you to outline goals, make it a smart goal, right? Smart, timely, relevant. Hey, you guys all got that, you're good. You want to ask the right questions that will help point you in the direction to be able to choose the right tools that will then allow you to measure your results and take action in analytics. I'm going to pause. I'm going to put my glasses back on. I'll turn my camera back on too so you can see me. Still here, still talking. And there's a couple of questions that I just want to touch on real quick. Um, how can I learn to use Google Analytics for my website? And does Google have tutorials? And the answer is yes to that. There are a couple of great tutorial sections. So we have what is called Skillshop, and you can just Google it, Skillshop, plural. And I think I may actually even have the link to that. I'm not sure if it's in this one or if it's the, at the end of the YouTube presentation, but I know I have it somewhere. Um, and the other is Primer. There's Primer is an app that you can download from the store, and it from iOS or Android. Google likes everybody, so that's fine. Whatever you have. Um, and Primer is five minute marketing lesson. Skillshop is more of an intensive breakdown on each little thing that you're watching. So, and Skillshop is actually, some of you were asking about certifications for these classes, or if I was going to give a certificate that says you watched it. We don't do that, but you can do that and get your certifications through Skillshop. So that's something to know. Um, can I use this to track all Facebook and Instagram YouTube traffic? Yes. Yeah, all of these are trackable in terms of, now your Facebook traffic, you're not going to track what's happening inside of Facebook. You're tracking when Facebook comes to your website. So analytics is on your website, not on any of the other stuff, right? Specifically, but there are data and metrics available within your Facebook page that you can track everything that's happening in Facebook for you. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't know what is the website address you go to to bring up those statistics. To bring up, let me see if I can go backwards in my slides here while I'm answering questions. Hold on. This one? Google Analytics? Yep, thank you. Okay, good. How does one use YouTube to produce good SEO for Google? Okay, that's in the next presentation, so I'm going to save that one. And should we be posting our Google business page or focus on content of our website? You should be doing both. That's more of like a connection to the SEO presentation. 
but you should definitely be doing both. Your Google business profile is going to help your SEO. It helps it connect yourself together. It also just helps in your general search and your organic listings that you have. So it should be both. GMB is really wildly popular right now. Um, not hear anything and I do not know why. I don't know either. Yes, you will get a recording. Everyone's still coming in in random places. So hi to you guys for that. Okay, so now I wanna pop over. I'm actually gonna move this around. I'm gonna fast forward this back to where we're here before we dive into advertising. And I want to kind of filter up here for just a second and find out some of these other ad questions. Um, let's see. Great suggestion. I wish I knew what that part was for. Um, how often to do your website update? Okay, so some of these are still from the first presentation. Update your website as often as you can. How do you find the best tags? Same, lots of marketing research. That's the best way to do. Um, where were my ads questions? Well, this is an ads question. Would you use TikTok to target first time home buyers? I think I would. I, that's, you're getting a gut answer from me on that question. Uh, I think I would. There's a lot of, because it's 30s and 40s, which are really booming on TikTok, especially right now. Uh, yeah, I'd think about it. Um, when would a sub page not show up? That's a whole different presentation. We got more in here. Okay. There are a lot of questions in here, you guys. You're doing really good. What's the name of the site again for the Google tutorial? So there's two. Google Primer is the app and Skillshop, S K I L L. S H O P, skill shop, one word, is for your tutorials. And that's number for luxury real estate marketing. I'm not sure what that question means. So you have to retype that one in. You offer another presentation sometime on marketing on Facebook, maybe. Maybe. Not really my super forte, but we can talk about it for sure. And definitely find people that are. All right, I'm going to turn my webcam back off and I want to go into the ads presentation so that again, we're staying on time as we move forward. So, this is really, I just want to be very clear as I go through here, whoops, that we are, I'm just giving you an overview. I'm not diving into super in depth stuff. As I told Isaac and the team earlier, I know enough on Google ads to be very dangerous with it. Right, but it's not something that I do every single day. So one thing that I want to point out before I go any farther, when you are creating a ads campaign and it's in a Google ad, right? A Google ads campaign, you get assigned an account manager and that account manager will actually call you. And I saw that question from a couple of times during the previous session. You know, people are calling me all the time from Google, blah, blah, blah. blah. Google will call you if you are running Google ads and that is your account manager. And trust me when I say this, they would much rather talk to you for 30 minutes about something that seems mundane and simple to you than get hung up on 50 more times while they're trying to connect to one of their customers, right? So this is what they do all day in, day out, take advantage of them. Now in Google ads, there's a couple of different places that your ads can appear. The two most popular are Google search network, which has been me going to Google search and typing in luxury real estate, right? And you pop up there in my search. The other is the display network. And the display network is the network and ads that will allow you to place advertisements or run a campaign on other people's websites. So Maybe you would show up on a blog. Maybe you could show up on a Chamber of Commerce website. Maybe you could show up on a contractor's website or a furniture store, right? You can think of lots of other industries that are kind of insular and connected to real estate that would also be very beneficial. So two different types of networks. To get started, what you're going to do is go to ads.google.com. And again, I have all of these URLs at the end of this presentation. 
And you're going to get started by entering your business name as you want it to be shown in your ads. And then you're going to enter your URL. This is okay to be very generic. This is just your website. You don't have to get very specific on what page you go to. This is just your website. I say that because yes, I'm going to talk about that in a couple minutes. The next thing, same thing as going into your analytics for your Google Ads, you also need a goal. Why is this really important? Well, because it's how you design your ad, right? It's what kind of creative you put behind it. It's what kind of result you're hoping to get for it. And it's also where I see the biggest mess ups, if you will, because often I think, as much as I think, I actually see this way more often than I should, which is why I now talk about it in my presentations. If your goal is to get people to call you because you're a salesperson, which means you're pretty good at talking probably, right? So I know that if I can get them on the phone, I'm more likely to set up a viewing appointment or a showing, right? Or to get a listing. So that's what I wanna do. And I also know that most people are going to be browsing the internet between the hours of 10 p.m. and 1 a.m. So I'm gonna run my ad to go between 10, 10 p.m. and 1 a.m. And I, because I want to advertise them to get my phone number. Don't do it. Because what's happening is you're advertising. These are paper calls, not paper click. So PPC, paper call. Every time someone calls you, you get charged. And are you going to really answer your phone at one in the morning? If you're not in your office to answer your phone. Don't run your ad for the phone number, right? So something to think about, run the ad during the hours that you actually want someone to call you. That's when you run your ad. Now the trick is to actually find the sweet spot within that, right? So that you're, I, I'm less busy in the morning. So I wanna run my ads first thing in the morning because that's my ideal time to take more phone calls. My afternoons are typically busier. That's the way it goes, however it's going to be. So you can pick your goal to be either get more calls, Get more visits. So you want people to actually walk into your door, which for new property developments, this would be fantastic, right? Because you want people to actually show up and see the new development that you've got. You want to be able to show them. Or perhaps you're trying to just get more website sales or signups. You're really just trying to drive traffic to your online presence. Then that third option is for you. Next, you're going to choose the areas where your ads can show. And you're going to define a radius around the business. Right, so it's the location of your business. You're gonna plug in where you are and you're going to work on the radius. Now your radius is defined by this white kind of rectangle box above the map and a slider bar. Now that slider bar is going to be pretty much constant through this ad section for you. The other constant is going to be this white box in the top right. That's your potential audience size. As you make different selections and you increase or decrease certain options, your audience size will obviously correlate. Your next option is to choose where you want your ads to show. So the first one is really where are you, and this is where do you want your ads to be played? So you're going to select that. In some cases, and especially in metro areas, you can go by neighborhood or by boroughs, <clears throat> depending on how it's described in the area that you're in. Sometimes it's zip code, sometimes it's by county. So depending on where you are, you can set those metrics there. Question, that was great. Can we arrange the radius for organic search like ad? Kind of, but not really. Your radius is around, that's one slide back. This is around your actual location, right? So how far do you actually want to go from your location to attract new customers? Okay, now you're going to de describe your product or services. So your category clearly is going to be real estate. That's very simple. And then on down here, the suggestions for you, these are options that you can also include. So for real estate, you're going to have obviously options connected to that category. The more you select, again, the higher the audience size potentially. Now here's some best practices for writing your ads. This is something Isaac and I were actually just talking about before we got started at the very beginning. When you create your ads, I suggest to you that you create more than one within each campaign. You're going to get three headlines, and in each headline, you get 30, 30 characters max for each headline. 
characters include spaces, emojis, punctuation. You get two description lines with 90 characters in each of those, and you have one display URL. Now, you heard me say at the beginning of this that your URL is just your website. This URL is not just your website. If you are running an ad campaign for this uh, new project that we're going to call Whipperwill, right? It's a new home development right up the street from me. I don't want my URL to be arambemus.com. I want it to be arambemus.com slash Whipperwill. That's going to take you straight to that page. What you don't want to do in your ads is create more work for your consumers. You want to take them directly to what you're advertising, right? And in your case, you're probably advertising very specific properties. You're not just advertising your and Bemis realtor, right? It, you're this development, that high rise, this uh, commercial facility for lease. Take them directly to that listing on your page so that they can see it. Most common error that I see in people running their own ads is that, right? <clears throat> the other thing that I will say this too, so you're creating multiple ads within one campaign. Google, at the beginning of your run for your campaign, will run each of those three ads consistently for the same percentage. And as it starts to gather, gather the data on the ad performance by paying attention to the analytics and the, and the performance of it, it will then automatically show less of the underperforming ad and more of the one that has been getting more traction for you. So Google kind of takes care of some of that stuff for you in terms of what's working and what's not, right? Next step is setting your budget. Clearly, you're going to select a budget that's offered as an option, or you can pick your own either way. Again, pay attention to your audience size. That's going to affect your overall cost. And then you're going to review your campaign and hit launch. So this is where you can edit or pause at any time. And I actually want to talk about this specifically right now because obviously this pandemic that we're in has changed things significantly. It's changed purchase habits and buying habits and selling habits and probably renting habits, right? You probably, I don't know if you're getting more rentals in now or, or less. It'd be really curious for me to know what you guys are doing in that regard. But in Google Ads, you can go in and pause your ads. And if you're promoting properties that really aren't selling right now, instead of continually paying for it, just hit pause. You can turn it back on in a month or you can turn it back on in two weeks, which would be much better than a month, right? Don't, don't spend money that you don't have to. That's me from a small business owner talking to you as a small business owner. Just know that you can do that whenever, if you're like, I am so busy, if the phone rings again, I'm gonna throw it against the wall. That's the problem we all wanna have, right? Well, then go in and turn off your ads. Don't run them if you don't have time to service new clients, and that's what you're trying to do. So this is also, you can check your performance reports, you can check your clicks, your impressions, you can monitor your spend, right? This is kind of your overview. You can remove irrelevant search phrases as well. So if somebody, let's say somebody's saying rent, and you don't want to be associated with someone that's using rent, you only want to lease properties, you could deselect rent so that you're not paying for that phrase to go in there. And Google Ads does connect to Google Analytics, so you can track your performance there. So there are a couple of other advertising options that I just wanted to quickly show you. Smart campaigns, uh, smart shopping campaigns allow you to show actual inventory and products. And you can do video ads on YouTube on the display network, which we're going to talk more about in the YouTube section that is coming right up. Now I am back to the resource section here. Some of you in our intermission said that our video didn't play very well. And so I apologize for that. And it was scratchy. So we actually had another one. And I think I'm not sure if Isaac is on and he can let us know if he wants to run that or not for the next one that we had set up for you. But here are all of the URLs that I talked about in this presentation for you. And while I have this on the screen, I'm going to pop over and see if there are more questions that I can answer quickly before I have two more minutes before we dive into the next section. Please play the video. Okay, so we're going to play the video. Nothing else exceeds high expectations quite like this. 
The Upper House Collection at King's Landing. Spacious suites with soaring views of an eight acre park. The majestic lobby features Canada's largest chandelier. The most EV parking in an Ontario residential development. An automatic touchless car wash amenity to keep your vehicle impeccable. The Upper House Collection at King's Landing. Visit ConcordKingsLanding.com for details.